Now that I'm an adult, I understand the energy behind poltergeist activity and going through puberty. But back then, it sometimes felt like a war zone. I'll admit, like any teenager I was often a pain in the butt, although ghost stories couldn't have been further from my mind when I crossed over the threshold of adulthood. Being a late bloomer at 14 years of age, I finally got my period two weeks after my birthday, which was when the strange events began. I'll never forget the first night. I got up and went to the bathroom, scared, but soon elated, that I was becoming a woman. As I walked back to bed, I felt like something was in the family room behind me. When I backtracked my way to the family room, I realized that the grandfather clock in the hallway had stopped ticking. I noticed that it slowly started up again when I got a few feet away from it. Intrigued as well as creeped out, I stepped backwards and nearly jumped out of my skin when it stopped once again. Back and forth, I kept testing it and every time, it stopped and started, depending on how close or far away I was. If that wasn't enough, I was soon distracted when the TV suddenly switched itself on. I froze on the spot and craned my neck to see. The static was loud and I could hear a voice, but it was scratchy and hard to make out. When my father came out in a temper, all the activity subsided. That was only the beginning of a period where I was blamed for all the malfunctioning equipment and appliances in the house. My parents thought I was crying out for attention, but all I wanted was for them to leave me alone. I couldn't convince them that I wasn't to blame for all the strange and sometimes frightening activity. It was worse when I was alone in the house. One afternoon, I got home from school and was relieved to be alone, at first. I put some music on the stereo and sat on my bed to get my homework out of the way. Then I heard a squeaky grinding noise coming from the door. When I looked up, I saw the handle slowly being pushed down. I stopped breathing as I stared intently at the handle turning 90 degrees, finally stopping like someone was holding the handle down, pointing to the floor. It was excruciating, waiting to see what would happen next. I wondered if it was my brother playing tricks on me, so I jumped off the bed and raced over to the door. I hesitated, as all the terrifying possibilities played across my mind. Staring at the handle, I slowly reached out and prepared to yank the door open, telling myself that if it was my brother, I'd give him a royal butt kicking. Before I had a chance though, the handle suddenly sprang upwards and back into place. I jumped, but then felt a surge of anger, so I grabbed the handle and opened the door. No one was there. I began to storm through the house, screaming my brother's name and feeling the tears welling up. Not one member of my family was home. I even checked for my cat, even though it was impossible for her to have played with the handle. She was outside on the fence. Then, my door slammed shut all by itself. I screamed and ran to the hallway. I stood at the end of the hallway and stared at my door. There were no windows open and for a minute I wondered if there was a burglar in the house. Thankfully, my parents pulled into the driveway and I raced out to tell them what had happened. My dad's quite a bruiser so he made us stay outside while he stormed into the house. It was only a few minutes later when he came back outside wielding the baseball bat and shaking his head, very annoyed. He grumpily told us that no one was in the house and 
that I had to get a grip on myself. I burst into tears and stomped into the house even though I was becoming quite afraid of the whole property. There were so many things that happened to me for that first year that I could easily fill a book. Ornaments would fall off the bookcase along with the occasional book falling out for no reason. One time, when I went out to the backyard to sunbathe, one particular wind chime went ballistic while the other stayed still. The hot faucet in the kitchen sink often turned itself on if I was in the room, and even the toilet flushed when I walked past the bathroom. The strange thing was, during that whole year, the events only happened in our home, not at school or out and about at friends' homes. Then the activity completely stopped on my 15th birthday. Now that I'm 38 and have children of my own, I worry about them going through puberty and I just hope that they don't have to go through what I did. I'll never know if it was just my own intense energy, but I can definitely say with certainty that I felt like I was under constant psychic attack. I'd like to preface this story by saying that I love my husband and don't have any history of substance abuse or mental illness. Believe me, I'm not giving anything away by telling you guys this information. I just feel that when you tell people about this type of stuff, it's important to start off with a good understanding about the people involved. The same goes for my husband Dean. We were childhood sweethearts and always knew that we were soulmates, like twins who were separated at birth. That's what makes my story so difficult to share, but I'll cut to the chase because I don't want to bore you with unnecessary details. It all started the night of our honeymoon. Not having a lot of money and wanting to sink what we had into our new home, we decided to stay in a nice cabin near a lake. We had a lot of fantasies about romantic boat rides, champagne and strawberries in front of roaring fires. You get the drift. As soon as we stepped foot in the cabin, I had a hunch that things weren't going to go well. Call it women's intuition. It doesn't matter. It's hard to describe, but I guess the best way to illustrate the atmosphere in the cabin was the sense of death and madness. My heart started palpitating before I even put my bags down. Dean sensed it too, but we decided that it probably just needed airing out, so we opened the windows. But the fresh air didn't help the darkness we felt in the cabin. Being very careful with money, we decided that we would stay, no matter what. We unpacked and decided to go for a walk in the nearby forest which sloped down to the water. We tried hard to lighten the mood, but the feeling stayed with us everywhere we went. Strange for us, we started to argue about stupid things. Dean started to show disdain at my weak attempts at humor. He scoffed and rolled his eyes, which he'd never done before. There were several times when I felt like he wasn't even himself. Once we got back to the cabin, his nasty new demeanor got worse. I asked him what was wrong and started to cry, which angered him quickly. Just imagine how hard it is to see a man who usually worships the ground you walk on suddenly turn into a psychotic monster. I tried to reason with him, but I soon started to respond in the same way. I became just as aggressive, and soon we were at each other's throats. We were so mad, we barely noticed the evil cackling in the background. As a matter of fact, we both blamed each other for the strange events that began to occur. When a mirror fell from the wall in the spare room, smashing into millions of pieces on a carpeted floor no less, Dean screamed at me from the kitchen thinking that I had done it. The thing was, I was in the bathroom at the time. 
By the second night, I felt like I was two people in one. I had moments of lucidity when I cried and tried to plead with Dean to be kind to me. When he snorted in disgust and told me to piss off, I flew into a rage. I shudder when I think of it now, but I grabbed the skillet off the stovetop and threw it at him, narrowly missing his head. It was on. My hands are trembling as I write this. Dean charged at me with his hands out like tiger's claws. I'll never forget his face because it wasn't his face at all. My anger prevented me from screaming in fear as I watched him closing in, looking like an old and twisted madman. His eyes were now dark, where they usually were blue. I felt his hands around my throat, but don't think I stayed still and mute. I felt a banshee screeching from deep inside me. I reached up and scratched his face while he tried to strangle me. The howls that came from our throats were unholy, but there were other voices howling somewhere deep in the forest. It was so surreal. What stopped me was the sight of blood trickling down his cheek. It was like I immediately changed back to my original self. And like a trigger, Dean too slipped back into his usual persona, complete with his handsome face. Suddenly, we hugged each other desperately. Dean whispered into my ear, We have to get out of here. I didn't even wait to respond. Both of us let go and scrambled around the cabin, dragging our things into our suitcases and racing to get out. The atmosphere in the cabin became darker, and it was difficult to even breathe. Outside, storm clouds had gathered, and soon a heavy downpour came down. We didn't stop until we got in the car. Dean started the engine, and we sat for a moment staring at the cabin. It was strange, but we felt like we'd escaped a madhouse. When we took off, we both burst into tears and apologized to each other profusely. We never discovered any history of that area and that cabin, but trust me, we're never going back. We all have people and places we like to go when in need of peace and understanding. Whether it be family, friends, or counseling through the medical or religious fields, it's a comfort to know where to turn when we find ourselves in a dark place. It's devastating when you realize that you have no one to turn to and nowhere to go. I'd like to preface this story with the fact that I used to be an atheist, thinking that ghost stories were ridiculous. That's what made what happened to me such a surprise, even though I can't definitively say to this day exactly what happened. Suffice it to say that I was completely bewildered and soon became a believer. Without saying too much about my situation, I was going through a tough time where my whole family turned against me, and my friends gave me a wide berth due to an identity crisis that put me in a dark corner. I went for a long drive one gloomy, rainy day and decided to stop when I saw a church in the mist. Even though I was an atheist, I felt drawn to the imposing structure, which seemed to be more like a shadow in the fog rather than an actual building. As I pulled into the driveway, I could feel an impetus driving me forward and into the building, like tentacles were dragging me in, magnetized by my sorrow. When I walked up the steps, I felt eyes watching me. Strangely enough, I wasn't afraid. 
even though I felt all the hairs on my body standing erect, as if I'd been electrified. When I went through the door and into the small foyer, I started to see shadows darting here and there. That's when my fear started to build. I asked myself, what am I doing here? I jumped when a voice answered my thoughts, solace. The voice echoed through the church like a disembodied spirit speaking from the pulpit. I started to shudder, but I couldn't stop myself from walking up the aisle and making my way to the altar. I had to call out, is anyone here? As I assumed that someone was waiting for me, even though the idea was completely absurd. I thought that I was dreaming when I saw hundreds of candles suddenly light up on their own, all around the interior of the church. I thought to myself, this can't be happening. I jumped again when the voice responded, believe. I turned around and strained my eyes to see who had spoken to me. Then a shadow came from the back. It was at that moment that I started to believe in ghost stories. This shadow figure soon morphed into a large looming priest, wearing a hooded cloak, like a Franciscan monk, but completely transparent. I knew that I was looking at a ghost, but I was rooted to the spot. Even though I was afraid, something told me that all this was happening the way it was supposed to. I stood bravely as he approached me and put out his hand. Not knowing what to do, I stayed still and trembled while he placed his hand on top of my head. I then felt a blanket of warmth emanating from my head all the way to my toes. I couldn't see the priest's face under the hood, but I reveled in the glorious transmission of peace. I closed my eyes and wept silently as I felt my spirit filling the dark depths of my body. I was transfixed by the flood of images in my mind, such as a bright blue sky and a brilliant white dove soaring to the heavens. It was all so surreal until I was back in my car. I was parked in an empty field with no church or priest to be seen. It took ages for me to start the car and pull out as the overwhelming feeling of warmth and peace continued to permeate my soul. Even though I felt like I'd just stepped into the twilight zone, I was not afraid. The rain had ceased and the sun shone through, adding to my feelings of hope and promise for the future. A few weeks later, I was at work and telling a new friend and trusted colleague about my experience. She advised that it didn't matter if the church existed or not. She said that God had reached out and touched my soul in my darkest hour. From that day forth, I accepted my identity and at the same time, my connection with the divine.